August 11th, 1973 was a pretty hot day in the Bronx, getting up to like 90 degrees, and Cindy Campbell was getting ready for her party. Since she was going back to school soon, she needed new clothes, but couldn't really afford to buy any. So, she decided she would host a party and use the money that she earned from that to buy herself some new stuff. She decided to use the rec room at the apartment complex that her family was living in at 1520 Sedgwick Avenue and let her brother provide the music. It's widely believed that her brother Clive Campbell, also known as DJ Cool Herc, created hip-hop at that party. Of course, it's reductionist and overlooks a whole host of influences to say that Herc just invented hip-hop out of thin air at that party. That didn't happen, but what did? Clearly, something revolutionary happened at that party because it was different enough for people to look to that moment and say that was the time that hip-hop was created. So, here's that story. If you like this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribe so you don't miss out on more stories like this from music history. Also, if you want early access to the videos and also the chance to vote on what topic I cover next, consider becoming a member. It's like three bucks a month and probably not really worth it, but if those perks sound great to you and hopefully there will be better perks down the line, feel free to sign up for that. I'd love it. Clive Campbell was born in Jamaica in 1955, but by 1967, his family had immigrated to the Bronx in New York City. At that time, Jamaica had a pretty vibrant neighborhood music scene that I've seen called dance halls, but other people have, like disputed that. So if you don't think they're called dance halls, that's fine. It doesn't matter. It's just neighborhood parties. Different areas would have different competing DJ crews, which were called sound systems, and each crew had one guy who would select the records to play. They'd have younger people working as kind of like hype men for their events, and kind of errand boys running around and doing all of the grunt work that needed to be done. Some of the earliest pioneers of these sound systems, people like Sir Nick the Champ and Tom the Great Sebastian, used a lot of American R&B and soul music in their parties, so essentially these guys would load up a truck with massive speakers, turntables, and generators and play imported American music for the neighborhood to party to. Clive would have grown up knowing about and seeing these sound systems happening all around him, even if he was too young to actually attend them. Because of the whole alcohol component, you had to be past a certain age, and he wasn't that. He said, quote, We used to be playing at Marvels and riding our skateboards. Used to see the guys bringing the big boxes inside of the hand carts. And before that, a guy used to put up watercolor signs on light posts, let people know there's going to be a dance coming. And the day before, you'd see a big hand cart, a hand man come with a truck, big boxes, a dance hall. You all could tell a dance hall. As Jamaicans immigrated to New York City and London and other major hubs, they took the idea of a sound system and spread it around the world in the same way they were importing American music, now they were exporting these dance hall and sound system ideas. So block parties started using the turntable speaker setup and even using some local Jamaican music in the mix. Clive, after being all around that culture in Jamaica and then seeing the export to New York City, started to make a name for himself only a few years after arriving in New York City. Clive was the really big guy. I couldn't find his actual height listed anywhere, but he's really tall. He was so tall that people started calling him Hercules, which eventually shortened to just Herc, because Clive thought that Hercules sounded too threatening. He said, quote, Someone called me Hercules. I didn't want to be Hercules. Everybody going to challenge you. I said, just call me Herc. I dropped the name Clive, end quote. After getting into a bit of trouble, he was brought into a group called the Five Percenters who kind of helped Americanize him, as he called it, and showed him the ropes and gave him mentors. And then he became involved with a graffiti group called the X Vandals, where he went by Clyde as cool, eventually just cool and then cool Herc, which was a combination of his previous nickname Herc, and it also played off of the cool cigarette commercials that were happening pretty ubiquitously through New York at that time. Herc's father was a mechanic, and he already owned a sound system, so Herc started messing around with it and teaching himself how to DJ. He would pull speakers out of abandoned cars to experiment making his own sound. He said, quote, I was messing around with the music, and I started out by buying a few records to play at my house. That's when his sister Cindy paid $25 to rent out the rec room of their apartment at 1520 Sedgwick Avenue to host her back-to-school party. She charged girls $25 Five cents to get in, boys were 50 cents, and then it was like a dollar for a beer, 25 cents for a soda, 50 cents for a hot dog, something like that. Herc, who was then like 16 years old, lugged their father's sound system from their second floor apartment and set it up in an adjoining room, like a room right next to the rec room, so that 
you couldn't see him, you would just hear the music through the wall. That party was his debut as a DJ and is also commonly known as the day that hip-hop was born. Though I think it's fairer to say, as one writer put it, quote, DJ Cool Herc didn't invent hip-hop's musical aesthetics as much as he unearthed it, buried in the drum breaks of soul and funk records, end quote. Herc was already making something of a name for himself with his graffiti work. People would see his name and his tags, but have no idea who he was, so he used that to his advantage when he was advertising the party. People would come just to figure out who this cool Herc guy was. He said, quote, I was there into my graffiti work, and that's where I graduated from the walls to the turntables. I used that curiosity of who I am on the flyer. There was a lot of curious people come to see who was doing it. Oh, this is what he does. I liked that. This was also an era of the New York outer boroughs in particular, where where gangs were starting to become a really big thing, so parties like Cindy's were kind of a safe space at that point. Later, they became just as dangerous, but at the time, people could go to these parties to just have fun and get lost in the music and not worry about all of the gang trouble that was coming around. And that's why several hundred people filtered through Cindy's party over the course of the evening. But all of these parties were not, if not common, they were around in New York. It wasn't like Cindy and Herc were doing something completely new. So what about this party in particular made it so foundational to hip hop? It's because Herc noticed something. Herc noticed that whenever he went to these parties and clubs, there was one part of a song in particular called The Break that always brought out the most dancing and the most energy. The Break was a part of like a funk or soul song where everything else faded away and it was just the drum beat and the percussion and people loved it. He realized that if he used two turntables with the same record on both, he could extend the break by switching back and forth between them. He said, quote, One night I was watching the crowd, and I thought I could extend the party. This was a technique that he would eventually perfect and name the merry-go-round, and he called the people who would come out and dance during his breaks, break dancers. And of course, like we've already said, it's far too simplistic to say that Herc created hip-hop at that party, even with his merry-go-round technique and extending the breaks. Other DJs were doing exciting things in other parts of the city, and of course, Herc wouldn't have gotten anywhere without the sound system parties of his youth. But it does make for an interesting and fun story to say that that was the moment that hip-hop was born, so I like going by it just because I like stories. Herc kept hosting parties, first at that same rec room at 1520 Sedgwick, before graduating when he ran out of space into other clubs and other event spaces. And almost every aspiring DJ at the time came to Herc's parties and left incredibly influenced. People like Grandmaster Flash, Jam Master J, Grandmaster Kaz all came to Herc's parties and were inspired to start doing their own thing. He said, quote, At the time I was into graffiti, so there was a lot of curiosity about who I was. And so when they came, they saw who I was and what I did. I fulfilled their expectations on me. As Herc's fame continued, to grow, he started to play clubs like the Twilight Zone, where he had a group of people who would often perform with him. Some dancers, some people who he would call up on stage to do a thing called toasting, and these people were known as the Herculords. Toasting was another thing that came from Jamaica. I'm sure it existed in other Caribbean islands and maybe even in South America. I'm not sure, but I know that Herc probably got it from Jamaica. It was talking usually in a steady monotone over a rhythm. It was a way to keep the audience engaged and entertained during the music, and Herc started calling on people that he knew in the audience, not just random people coming to see the spectacle of his party, but like friends of his, people he played basketball with, people he grew up with, to come up and start toasting or being the MC. MC stood for Master of Ceremonies. And MCing was kind of like the next evolution of toasting. It was that thing that pushed toasting into rapping, I would say. Leave a comment if you think I'm wrong about that. One of the people who became his top MC and the number one Herculord was a guy named Coke LaRock. He was at that original party in 1973, and Herc called him up to MC at that party, and a lot of people think that was the first instance of an MC rapping over a DJ set, but it's kind of impossible to know that for sure, and I'm Certain other people disagree with that, but Coke LaRock is commonly referred to as the first hip-hop rapper. His lyrics were almost always improvisational. He would just grab the mic and say the first rhymes that came to his head, though he did have like catchphrases that he would repeat. Even though he never recorded, he was incredibly influential for that first wave of hip-hop MCs. The Sugar Hill Gang even used one of his rhymes in their hip-hop breakout record, Rapper's Delight. Coke LaRock, whose real name I still can't find, was given that nickname because he had to drink cocoa-flavored milk when he was a baby, and Coke quickly became really good friends with Herc whenever Herc's family moved into the Bronx. Cindy, Herc's sister, said, quote, Herc had a lot of friends, but Coke was always around. He was like our brother. 
end quote. Coke said about when he first started rapping, quote, man, when I first started, I didn't know anything about rapping. I just got on the mic playing around. I was a quiet guy, but when the music started playing, it just brought out another person. The talking just came out of me, end quote. Coke and Herc became a force, the background of the early hip-hop scene in the Bronx. One artist, DJ Red Alert, called them the Batman and Robin of hip-hop. They introduced the world to the concept of a DJ and a rapper and helped inspire an entirely new genre. And although other people were doing a similar thing by this point, by the time that Herc really got started, he was the main attraction whenever he played. He said, quote, You couldn't throw a party on my night. I had guys had to change change their dates if they found out I'm giving a party on the same night, end quote. Herc claimed that he was never inspired by anyone else. He didn't pay attention to what other DJs were doing. He didn't even go to their parties. His main inspiration was watching the crowd and seeing how they reacted to things and then finding out a way to prolong that or do that better. So with this heavy influence and importance to the birth of hip hop, it's worth noting why DJ Cool Herc and Coke LaRock aren't better known. Sure, people who know hip-hop, especially the early days, people who are probably watching this video know about Cole Herc, they know about Coke LaRock, they know that story, but if you stop your average person on the street, even someone who listens exclusively to hip-hop, they might have no idea who DJ Cole Herc even is, let alone his incredible importance to the genre that's so ubiquitous in culture these days. Part of that was because he was still in high school, so he couldn't fully capitalize on this moment he was having because he couldn't play every night or even every weekend. He had to still go to school. But by 1974 or 1975, he was kind of like the main attraction. Like I said earlier, everyone wanted to go to his parties. So it wasn't just that. There was something else going on, too. I think the reason DJ Cole Herc doesn't have the same name recognition, the same level of respect as people like Grandmaster Flash or LL Cool J is because he never recorded, at least not back then. There's a story I heard once, I don't know if it's true, I tried to find it again but I couldn't, but it sounds like it would be true, that Sylvia Robinson, who was the R&B singer who heard hip hop and really wanted to record it so she put together the Sugar Hill Gang in order to do so, first approached Cool Herc about recording hip hop because she wanted, you know, the big name at the time to be behind this recording. but. Herc just didn't understand how hip-hop would work on a record, so he refused to do it. Herc thought that hip-hop was party music. It was stuff to dance to, to play live. It wasn't something to go home and put on your record player and just listen to. He just, he didn't get the vision that Sylvia Robinson had of recording hip-hop. But by the end of the 70s, when Herc started to see other bands and artists and rappers recording hip-hop music and he started to get a little bit more, he changed his mind and he wanted a part of that. He was in talks to get some records done, but then life got in the way. He said, quote, I ain't too far from it. I just, at the time, people got older, having responsibility, and then narcotics came in. I started medicating myself. My father died. That put me in a slump. I got stabbed up in 1977. Drew me back into a little shell. So, Herc never managed to get a record out, and the hip-hop world slowly passed him by. He said things started to change, and... He wasn't exactly willing to change with it. He still did a few parties, but by the 80s, he had completely pulled back into his shell. But Cindy did point out how DJ Cool Herc stepping back allowed other DJs to step into that void. It allowed other people to take up the mantle and start doing their own thing and experimenting. They still wanted that DJ Cool Herc party, but without Cool Herc to be there to do it, they had to do it themselves, and that allowed other people to build up this community. If it was just on the shoulders of Herc, it probably would have faltered out and died, but by him kind of stepping back, it allowed other people to keep going. He really stepped back in 1977 after that stabbing that he mentioned in the quote that I said earlier, and that happened at a club when he tried to break up a fight, and it really scared him off of the hip-hop community entirely. In 1984, he starred as himself in a movie called Beat Street, which was like the first movie made about this new hip-hop genre, and his father passed away, which sent him spiraling into a depressive slump. He started getting pretty heavily addicted to crack. He was able to go to rehab and he got himself clean, but he was never able to reassert himself at the top of the hip-hop pyramid. He's done a few performances on and off throughout the years, but now he says that he no longer DJs. He said, quote, It's not about me no more. I did my thing. Other people come in. The basic stuff came from me. The stew had been cooked already. Don't break it up. Run with it. How long it lasts? Go ahead. End quote. In the early 2010s, he suffered from some pretty major health complications and he didn't have any insurance to cover it, so he had to, like, do crowdfunding in order to even be healthy, which 
is absurd. Whole commentary on the American healthcare system we can get into here. Let's save that for other channels. He and Cindy worked really hard to start a foundation to make sure 1520 Sedgwick Avenue is protected as the historical landmark that, frankly, it deserves to be. He did end up releasing his first album in 2019, and it seems like he's kind of trying to get a little bit back into the spotlight than he was for most of his life. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2023, and he started to do a few more interviews. So it seems like he's ready to get out there and start getting the flowers that he deserves. So that's the story of DJ Cool Herc and how some people say that he invented hip-hop on that night in 1973. Let me know your thoughts below. Use the comment section. Let me know any other cool facts that I missed out on, anything you think other people should know. After I did my video about Rock Him, I got a lot of comments about other rappers who should be in that greatest rapper of all time discussion or most influential so i've got some ideas planned to cover some of them some of the most common people mentioned but let me know in these comments below who else i should cover from the early days of hip-hop it's something that i love looking into and don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you want it's free you can always unsubscribe